Welcome to this online lesson looking at the medical renaissance. This is the next major era of medical discovery that we'll be studying in this course. In this introductory lesson our aims will be to know some features of renaissance medicine, to explain how improvements in science helped the medical progress, and also to assess the potential for progress in the renaissance period. First of all we're going to have a look at a bit of an introduction to what the renaissance was. These two paintings can help us understand that, especially when applied to medicine. Firstly record this key word, renaissance. This means rebirth, in this case the rebirth of science and discovery. It's sort of related to the idea that the church was no longer going to hold complete sway over what people thought, and people were rediscovering more inquiring ways. This was crucial for challenging old and often incorrect ideas about medicine. Also the Renaissance is famous for its art style as well, as shown with these two pictures. So have a go at these tasks. Firstly record the keyword and definition. Then secondly, which picture do you think was made first or earliest? Explain why you think this. Secondly, give two ways that picture B is more accurate than picture A. And fourthly, picture B was printed. Explain the potential importance of this in medical progress. OK, pause the video here while you complete those tasks. So hopefully we've recorded the key word. The picture that was made earliest is picture A. The two ways that picture B might be more accurate than picture A, well there's lots of different ways, but firstly have a look at the way that the muscles are drawn and the pose of the person is far more realistic. It appears to have been drawn with a huge amount more skill. Not only that, if you look closely each muscle has been labelled. This suggests a pretty deep understanding of the human body and how it was constructed. In other words, anatomical knowledge. And the significance of picture B being printed is that this image could be reproduced thousands of times. This means that this accurate representation of the human body could be shared far and wide and lots of different people could learn from it. That meant that this sort of knowledge could be shared more easily and therefore progress was more likely as understanding improved. So let's consider when the Renaissance was. It's important to put it in context with regard to the rest of our studies. The medieval period was the first period that we studied. Now we're going to be looking at the Renaissance, which follows on from it. This timeline should put in context when the Renaissance was, at least approximately. It goes from 1200 right the way up to 1800. So first of all, let's add on some uh, examples of key events that we've already studied. The Black Death reached Britain in 1348, so I've placed it roughly halfway between 1300 and 1400. The Tudor period in English history was between 1485 and the accession to the throne of Henry VII and 1603 with the death of Queen Elizabeth I. The English Civil War occurred between 1642 and 1649, or at least the first Civil War did. And here we can see the periods that we're, we're mentioning. The Middle Ages runs roughly to about 1450. That's not an exact science though, which is why I've put Renaissance circa or around 1450 to circa 1700. Some historians would say that the Renaissance began before that, others would say that it ended before 1700 too. It really isn't a precise science. So, using a scale of 3 centimetres equaling 100 years or 1 century, you're going to create your own timeline now. I recommend that you use a pencil and ruler to do this so that if you make any mistakes you can easily correct them. Create your own timeline in which to add these key figures and dates. Add the ones that I've already up, got up, up here, but also leave plenty of space for you to update it with key figures and dates as you go through this course. It would be a very useful at a glance revision uh, activity to do this and a uh, revision resource as well. As an extension, as I've mentioned, circa 1450 means around 1450. Why can't we be precise as to when the Renaissance starts? Anyway, it'll take you a little while to do that, so pause the video while you do it. Well, let's consider that extension question, assuming that you've got your timeline completed. The thing is, it doesn't start in one place at the same time, and it really is a matter of opinion. It's not as if one person just went to bed one night and then got up the next morning and decided that the Middle Ages had ended and the Renaissance had begun. It was a gradual process of different art styles, scientific techniques, and uh, interpretations, for example, of things like religion, which really represent the Renaissance. And like I say, it doesn't happen all at the same time, all in the same place. Let's consider the Renaissance in terms of progress. 
There were crucial breakthroughs in the Renaissance in the fields of art, science and technology, but also there were challenges to religion. This should lead to massive progress, surely. Well, it did, partly. By 1700, people were barely any healthier than they had been in the Middle Ages, despite significant medical progress. So have a think about this and note down your answer. Why might this progress not lead to advancements in health as well as medical understanding? Pause the video while you give that some thought and jot down a quick answer. So what did you think? Some of the medical renaissance uh, discoveries relate to the understanding of the human body. This could lead to quite significant advances in terms of the understanding of things like anatomy, how the body is put together, but not necessarily that many advancements in terms of physiology, in other words, how the body works. Equally, medical progress does not necessarily relate to the discovery of what caused diseases, and this was crucial for making people healthier. Without understanding what caused diseases, it's much more difficult to prevent disease. And so, overall, health of ordinary people might not be much better because of Renaissance medical progress. Nevertheless, the, these advancements would eventually help medicine to progress even further in later centuries. Here's a really crucial example of progress too. This is a diagram of a printing press. And it's worth remembering that ideas at this time had to be recorded on paper or parchment and then shared. If this was handwritten, then only a few copies could be made very, very expensively and very slowly. The printing press made knowledge much more accessible and affordable. What we're going to do now is going to create a mind map on the Renaissance. You can include the heading like the one I've done on the screen here on a piece of paper or in your own notes. Alternatively, you could write these under different headings. I prefer to do a mind map though with big wavy lines which represent almost branches on a tree and you can also illustrate it as well. This uh, method of revision and uh, note collection is a good way of dual coding. In other words, making sure that you are processing the information more than one time so that you are more likely to remember it and encode it into your long-term memory. So let's have a look at the categories that we're gonna study with this mind map. First category we're gonna have a look at is art. I'd recommend you choose one colour for this, which again is a good way of encoding it and categorising these different findings. The next is science, the next is technology, and the next is religion. You may find you need more branches than this, but I'd recommend that you use at least three branches uh, which would um, correlate to three specific details or facts for each of your mind map, your, uh, mind map sections rather. So pause the video here and prepare your mind map or your notes before we move on to the information. Okay, let's have a look. Firstly, we're going to have a look at factor for change number one, art. Source one shows a medieval portrait of Mary with Christ. Any thoughts about this? Is it accurate? I mean, you might argue it's quite beautiful, but look at the baby. It looks like a miniature person rather than an actual baby, doesn't it? It is a very stylized picture. It is not one that is at all realistic in its proportions. Compare that to Botticelli's famous painting here. This was painted in the Renaissance. Notice the detail of the musculature on the people and the natural poses that they have, even considering some of them are unrealistically flying. So, on our mind maps, we can take some notes from this. In source one, what clues show that Giotto did not study the human body to paint his pictures? In source two, what clues in source two show that Botticelli did study the human body? And three, how did the artists who studied the human body closely help doctors? Bearing in mind that by studying the human body closely, they are doing something that doctors kind of do as, as well. That is, to look at the body and diagnose it, or at least case, in this case, try and get it realistically reproduced in a piece of artwork, whether it's sculpture or as here, paintings. So add notes to your mind map and complete those questions. Pause the video here while you complete this first section on art. So 
So for question one, hopefully we've recognised that Giotto was not actually studying the human body in great amounts of detail because of the unrealisticness of the poses and the unrealistic nature of the, of the baby Jesus. Also, you'll notice that the perspective on Mary's face is a little bit off as well. It's probably still better than I could paint, but you get the idea. What about the clues in source two? Botticelli definitely did study the human body and you can see this in the realistic muscle, muscles of the people and the way that they are standing, even if the scene itself is not especially realistic. This is in stark contrast to the picture in source one, which is supposed to be more naturalistic, but somehow fails to be so. And hopefully we've identified that by studying the human body, doctors would be able to do the same thing and make their notes more realistic and have a better understanding of exactly how the human body functioned. When you're done with that, let's move on to the next section. Factor number two, science. The Renaissance was a time of great discovery. Galileo used telescopes to learn about the planets and help prove that the Earth orbits the Sun and not the other way around. Leonardo da Vinci was not only an amazing artist, he also came up with many new and modern ideas, even if he had no real idea of how to build them. These included things like the tank and the helicopter. Science now used experiments and records to prove their new ideas, record them and also share them. So how might the desire to find new discoveries challenge the old ideas of Galen and Hippocrates? Give that some thought and add it to your notes too. Otherwise, add notes to your mind map. Pause the video while you complete that. So, this new desire for discovery and new knowledge would challenge the old ideas of Galen and Hippocrates. Remember, for all the things that Galen and Hippocrates got right, or which seemed sensible, very often these things were accepted without question. In fact, it could be very dangerous to challenge these ideas. Instead, this desire to discover new things meant that people were more open to challenging these old, old ideas and correcting some of their mistakes. That's a great way of making progress. Factor three, technology. The Renaissance saw the invention of the printing press. This allowed books to be made more quickly, accurately and cheaply than ever before. This allowed information to be shared much more widely and much more easily. Even pictures could be engraved on wooden blocks and printed. And you can see an example of such an engravement, engraving below. So why would cheaper, more widely made books help medical progress? Answer that question. And also, new weapons like guns were invented too. How might they help medicine, even if they didn't help people's health? Consider those questions, add answers to your mind map, and also add further notes that you think will be helpful. Pause the video while you complete that. Remember that books are a way of transferring information reliably, but also cheaply and easily. It's really important, this idea, because before then, books were incredibly expensive. Only very, very few people could access them and use them. And also mistakes could be very easy to make if they were reproduced any more than a few times. Printed books were more accurate, easier to get hold of, and also far more widely available. But what about the new weapons? Well, remember, new weapons like guns were invented, which would cause new types of wounds. These would need to have new solutions to try and treat them for, uh, for battlefield surgeons. So although they were very bad for people's well-being, they actually might provoke some medical progress. And there's a particular example of this happening, which we'll study another time. That's not all we have on technology. This picture shows a pumping system. It uses different pumps and chambers to circulate water around a wheel. Other developments had an impact on medicine too, or at least indirectly. Water pumps like the one I've just described were developed. This might have contributed to later ideas about the circulation of the blood. In a future lesson we'll look at a man called William Harvey who managed to demonstrate that blood circulates rather than being used up and created like a fuel. Here's a diagram from the Renaissance of the human heart. Notice how they recognise that the heart also has chambers, a little bit like the pump. So the link was definitely there. An improved uh, use of accurate art and mechanical understanding could actually have an indirect impact on the understanding of the human body as well. All right, pause the video here and add further notes to your section on technology on your mind map. On 
to our last section, religion. As in the Middle Ages, the church controlled knowledge. This meant that some new ideas were stopped and this held medicine back. But new religious ideas were challenging this control. Protestants, led by Martin Luther in Germany, but with ideas that soon spread around to other parts of Europe, were bringing new ideas to religion. From the 1400s onwards, the church no longer banned or discouraged human dissections, allowing people to learn more about the body, and that Galen got some things wrong. Remember that Roman religion too forbade the uh, use of human bodies in dissections. Galen had to use animals and had made assumptions about the way that animals' bodies were constructed and applied those to human beings, even if they were not true. It was not possible to, ch to challenge these ideas before the uh, Renaissance when human dissection became more common. The picture, or rather engraving, that we can see here is a printed image that shows just such a Renaissance uh, dissection, with lots of different people studying the dissection and therefore learning from it. OK, pause the video here and add some notes to that final section on your mind map. Done? OK, let's move on. Let's draw the information that we've gathered together. You should now have some idea of the sorts of progress being made in the Renaissance in a wider sense, and hopefully you're thinking about applying that information to medical context as well. So first of all, describe in full sentences two to three ways that science, technology and art advanced in the Renaissance. It would be especially helpful if you could apply this to medical developments too. Secondly, explain how either science or technology helped medicine to get better. And thirdly, explain why Renaissance advances may help some areas of medicine, but have little effects on others, like health, which we've discussed before. Pause the video while you complete those tasks. So hopefully you've been able to do that. If you are unable to complete sections one and two, you need to revisit the information or do some wider revision and reading. I've included a useful link for this in the description to this video. For part three then, why did it help in some areas and not in others? Well, perhaps you're recognising already that understanding of the human body and anatomy, or at least how it was put together, so to speak, really did improve in the Renaissance. But an understanding of how the body worked, well, developments there appear to have been less vast. Indeed, we've not said anything yet about the understanding of what causes disease. So on that note, we can see that the Renaissance does have some progress in some areas, certainly more than there was in the Middle Ages, but in other respects there are examples of continuity where things get little better. And on that note, the lesson is over. I hope it's been useful, at least as an introduction, and if you do need to do some wider reading, have a look at that link in the uh, description. If this was useful to you, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and there'll be more content on medicine soon. Thanks very much and goodbye.